Hi everyone. I hope that you are doing well. I did not manage to do the recording correctly in class today, but I am putting together um, some of the material that I have. I have audio from part of class, but not all of class that I am pairing with a new video recording. Um, so I apologize for the places where this is a little awkward, but I hope that this gives you the material that you might need in preparation for the final exam, mm -hmm. um, where today we're going to talk a bit about vaccines. Immunologists start talking about vaccines mm -hmm. where they talk about Edward Jenner, who did the experiment shown here in a painting in 1796, um, which was published in 1798, and you can see um, the paper that was published in 1798 on the right. Um, the story goes that Jenner observed milkmaids with beautiful skin and hypothesized that maybe having had cowpox protected them from smallpox. Um, and he tested this hypothesis by taking an eight-year-old boy, James Phipps, injecting him with cowpox, and then actually infecting him with smallpox. Um, yes, there are lots of reasons why ethically this is a very bad idea, and we should not do things like this. Um, but Jenner did find that James Phipps was protected from smallpox. Um, this is sort of usually cited as the first ever immunology experiment, but one thing to point out is that there are a number of cultures around the world that already had traditions of doing similar types of things, of exposing people to materials from smallpox scabs in order to protect them against smallpox. Um, and so this is actually something that we see in a number of cultures. In fact, um, the first similar uh, type of thing that was done in the United States was actually brought to the United States by an enslaved person who whose culture did this, um, who told um, Cotton Mather, and then this um, was done by Cotton Mather in Boston. Um, so while we sometimes talk about Jenner as the beginning here, we should recognize that many cultures um, were in fact doing something relatively similar to this. Also, um, I want to point out that we now know that this nice pretty story is probably not entirely correct. Um, it looks as though Jenner observed this from a rural doctor who was traveling, um, who was doing this very similar protocol. Um, and it also looks like, um, from all the data we have, it probably actually wasn't cowpox um, that Jenner used. Um, we talk about cowpox. In fact, vaccination um, comes from the Latin for cow of vaca um, for the idea of using cowpox. But now um, genetic evidence suggests that it was most likely horsepox that Jenner was using. Um, there was actually a Jenner question in one of the uh, semifinal matches um, in uh, Jeopardy. I think it was one of the semifinals, one where I was in the audience um, in the recent Jeopardy tournament um, about Jenner. And I kind of wanted to give them a little bit of but actually from the audience um, about all of this. You might look at this and say, okay, this is very old timey stuff. Who cares? Why is any of this particularly important? And one of the big reasons why um, this is important to talk about is this protocol that was described by Jenner um, led to the eradication of smallpox worldwide. So this is one of only two viruses that we've actually made go extinct on purpose using vaccination. Um, so you can see that the World Health Organization officially declared smallpox eradicated on December 9th, uh, 1979. So 44 years ago, years ago tomorrow. Um, and this is, like I said, one of only two viruses that we've ever purposefully made extinct. The story on this one is that basically there are two labs that still have um, vials of smallpox and otherwise the uh, virus is gone. And so all of this is coming from vaccines. It's not just smallpox that is an infectious disease that has been impacted by vaccination. Here you can see an image from the Atlantic where we can see the annual um, number of um, cases in the United States 
uh, of particular infectious diseases before vaccines compared to the percent of cases after vaccines in the United States. Um, that's the syringes with numbers on either side, as well as a percent decrease. And so you can see that vaccines have had a tremendous impact on all of these infectious diseases over time. Um, I also want to show you a video. Um, it's this YouTube link that's on the left here that also indicates sort of the success of vaccines. We can look at this graph and we're going to watch this um, move forward when I hit play. You can see in the upper right hand corner, we have a year and this is the history of different infectious diseases in the United States. Um, we're looking at the number of cases reported in the U.S. of a number of different infectious diseases. And we're going to focus on things in pink where there's a vaccine available and things in green, uh, where, sorry, pink where the vaccine is not available and green where the vaccine is in fact available. You can see the number of cases of those infectious diseases per year on the x-axis. Notice this goes up to about 8,000 because as time is going to go on, um, we're going to see a big change in this x-axis. So what I want you to look at here are the number of cases of many of these infectious diseases and how those case numbers change um, when vaccines are recommended. Uh, and you can see in 1912, you know, measles, diphtheria, typhoid fever, um, and polio are kind of the biggies in the United States. Um, we can watch measles remains a particularly big infectious disease in all of these years. Um, and uh, it varies from year to year. Now you can see diphtheria and smallpox are kind of going away because of their vaccines. Um, and we can still see these high numbers of measles vaccines. Overall, infectious disease is going down a bit um, over these years. Um, we've now seen whooping cough basically go away due to its vaccine. Um, and now in the 60s, you see the measles vaccine come in and we see this dramatic reduction in measles. And in fact, we are now at one eighth of the um, x-axis that we had before. We now get to the 80s and it's a totally different set of infectious diseases like chicken pox um, that is dominating. And you can see that many of the past infectious diseases have vaccines, they've gone away. Now you can see that happening with chicken pox as well. And now you can see that we get to only, you know, what is this, 5% or something of the number of uh, previous cases. Now we're, I guess, one-tenth or less. So here you can see those numbers in 2017 compared to the highest ever rate of these infectious diseases observed. And you can see just how dramatically we have decreased these numbers of infectious diseases. With infectious diseases, it's not just about the big decrease in number of deaths. We can also think about uh, decreases in uh, number of sickness, uh, amount of sickness, it decreases in healthcare costs, decreases in um, people losing days of work, decreases in people losing childcare, um, changes in medical costs, all of those things. And we can see that vaccines have been incredibly useful. Um, and uh, very um, financially um, important innovations. This is the point where I started recording audio in class. And so now we're going to switch over to the audio that I recorded in class. I apologize for places where I may be a little bit repetitive um, with what I've just recorded for you. These are the, um, by far the, um, best public health investment and give us a, the best return on our investment of kind of whatever we've come up with. This is just showing you um, return on investment for every dollar in things like, you know, cardiovascular disease research or community health workers or infrastructure or preschool, all of which are things we know are good. And look how much more money we get on our investment from vaccines. Um, and definitely if we also add in things like agricultural vaccines and so like how many cows we've saved for food and all that stuff, vaccines are by far the most effective and sort of best money saver that we have ever come up with for anything. Um, so go team immunology. 
Um, and our understanding of vaccines is related to um, our understanding of secondary immune responses. And so I've shown you this information about secondary immune responses before, where we've seen infection with some kind of virus. We've seen that virus you know, re replicate. It's gonna make you sick for a little while. Eventually, we're going to have our adaptive immune response clear that virus. Then you'll stop feeling sick and you'll feel better. Hooray. Um, but if you were to be exposed to that virus again, now you are going to have a secondary immune response that's gonna be much bigger, uh, faster, all that good stuff. And so we're going to clear that virus quicker. I made this slide in 2009. And um, I like to point that out because there are a couple things I wanna show you in terms of what I did on this slide when I made it back in the day. Note that when I show you the secondary immune response here, um, I show you getting sort of exposure to the microbe with this little arrow, and I show the microbe actually reproducing in you for a really short period of time. There is a little pink bar here. It's not as though this microbe completely block, or th this vaccine is completely blocking the microbe from ever coming into your body. The microbe can still infect you. The idea is that we have actually made it so the immune response is going to be so rapid and so robust that we're going to get rid of that microbe before it ever causes illness. So note that you know, there, the idea here is not necessarily that you don't get infected, it's that you don't get sick. Um, for a long time, we didn't know how to measure the difference between those things. And so when we saw you didn't get sick, we saw, huh, you must not have gotten infected. But now we know how to measure you haven't gotten infected, and we can tell actually a difference between those things. This is also where the idea of you can never get the chicken pox twice comes up, given that you guys have in many cases been chicken pox vaccinated. That's probably a less useful um, phrase for me to say that you haven't probably heard as often, and this is also now where someone raises their hand and tells them that their cousin who got the chicken pox twice. Um, but anyway, this is kind of the basic biology behind what we're talking about here. We saw something very similar to this when we talked about the Bura paper um, in class. Um, and if you remember, we saw all sorts of really um, great things. This was the Dirty Mouse paper. Um, and we saw these great things about experience with antigen or experience with infection and great things it did for your immune system. But we had a caveat. We had a big caution. And the caution was that, well, yeah, having an immune experience is great, but it comes with a pretty big risk. And some fraction of the mice in that uh, paper died. And so secondary immune responses are awesome, but in order to get to a secondary immune response, you gotta get infected once and get a primary immune response, and that's pretty risky. And depending on what the microbe is, that risk can vary. And so the idea with a vaccine is to give you some kind of preparation to induce a primary immune response um, without you having that risk of um, severe illness or death. Um, we can come back to some details about side effects as we move forward. But the idea is that this way, if you ever come in contact with the real microbe, um, when you come in contact with that real microbe, you're going to be making a secondary immune response, not a primary immune response, and you're gonna get all of those um, secondary immune response benefits. Again, I made this slide in 2009, and note that I don't show you that you're going to be completely blocked from the microbe ever getting into your body. The microbe might come in and reproduce for a really short period of time, but that great secondary immune response that you make um, is going to be able to clear it up really quickly before you're going to see symptoms or particularly before you're going to see severe symptoms. And so this is really the idea that we're trying to do with a vaccine. When people think about vaccines, this is often kind of the stuff that they think about. Um, they think a lot about the idea that they are going to become immune. <laughs> and they are going to protect themselves. Um, 
and they think about this impact, which is sort of thought of as the individual immunity impact. I'm going to get a vaccine, and then none of you are going to be able to sneeze on me and make something bad happen to me, right? Is sort of what people often think about. And that is a key reason why um, vaccines work and a key point to vaccines related to the immune responses we will see. Though I'm going to say a little bit more about individual immunity a, a little bit later. This was actually one place where I was struggling with the order of the slides, so I'm going to come back to individual immunity. Um, but there is also a second benefit of vaccines. And these are the more population level effects that we see in addition to the individual effects. Um, in the vaccines assignment that you guys were doing for homework today or that you are doing before five, a lot of what you were doing is looking at the math of these population level effects. Um, and so the key here is that we realize that vaccination um, breaks the transmission cycle of host-host spread in a population. So if I get vaccinated for something and then I come to our class and I lecture to you, my vaccination is also protecting you because you're now not going to have me broadcasting virus at you. So I, we have actually stopped spread in our whole population by me being vaccinated. And so we're less likely as a community to have an epidemic from my being vaccinated. Um, this is usually really dependent on some specific numbers. So the idea, to be honest with you, if it was just me getting vaccinated in this whole room, I wouldn't have a huge effect. But once we get to a specific percentage of people in our community who are vaccinated, then we see a huge difference in infection. Um, it doesn't end up kind of scaling perfectly linear. Like once you're above the threshold, there's a huge drop off in spread that maybe doesn't happen below the threshold. And that's one of the things that I hope you saw with the assignment is that it's sort of, you know, it's not a perfectly linear thing in terms of how many people can get protected. Um, the idea is that spread stops when the probability of infection drops below a critical threshold. That threshold varies among populations. It also varies with different microbes. Um, so you can see here um, some different numbers for different microbes um, in terms of what per the percent of people has to be to be vaccinated. Um, some of this is related to properties of the micro, particularly how well that micro spreads um, in the environment and person to person. So that's why measles is, has the highest known um, ability to spread. It also is the one that you need the highest percentage of people to be immune to. Um, things like population density, um, as well as some other factors in terms of a population can also change this. So you can see, you know, I don't give you a number for measles or a number for smallpox because it really depends on the population that we're looking at. Um, this phenomenon is known as herd immunity. Um, this concept got a lot more frequently discussed during the pandemic. Um, those of us who were doing a lot of science communication learned that a lot of people really didn't like the term herd immunity. They didn't want to be like called farm animals or something. Um, and so a lot of people in, in the field have actually tried to change the term. So a lot of people don't say herd immunity anymore. We now say community immunity. And that is really hard to say. Um, so I know that many of my slides are still out of date with herd immunity. We can go either way. Um, but the idea here is that if we have an infected person in a population where everybody is susceptible, our infectious disease is just going to spread throughout this population. If, however, some fraction of people are immune, then even the other people who are not immune are protected because they're less likely to come in contact with the infected individual. Um, so I want to show you two um, sort of simulations to show how this works. Um, so one simulation um, is shown here. I don't need Ben Stiller anymore. Um, 
So what we're going to see in this simulation is we've got six different populations. Um, in the six different populations, we're going to have um, different fractions of the people susceptible. So here, there's going to be 100% susceptible. That means zero got vaccinated. Here, we're going to see 75, which means 25 got vaccinated, um, and so on. Um, and uh, the people are, if I remember correctly, vulnerable people, well, we'll see with the colors. But we're going to be able to see people who are immune, people who are susceptible, people who are infected, and we're going to watch the infection go. In every case, the infection is going to start kind of near the bottom of the rectangle and go upward. And one of the things I want you to notice here is how much the, this is sort of a threshold behavior where it's kind of like above and below a certain number. It, then things change. It's not like a perfectly linear kind of change. And so each dot is one person. Um, green is immune, yellow is vulnerable, red is infected, and we are going to see what happens amongst these populations. So what you can see is that at you know, 0%, our infectious disease basically ran through the whole population. At 25%, we basically ran through the entire population, or almost the entire population. At 50, we still ran through pretty well. But then once we got to 75, you can see that the probabilities were such that spread really kind of stopped pretty early. When we get to 90 and 95, we saw basically no uh, spread going on. And um, if I remember, this shows it again with uh, a slightly different microbe to show you that it doesn't always look exactly the same based on the kinetics of the microbe. Okay, yeah, so the next one is measles, which is, spreads really fast. What you should notice is that the threshold, you know, is, is different here. So now 75% wasn't entirely enough to stop this moving to the population. We needed a higher percentage. And that's due to some um, features of measles. Um, I'm going to show you one other simulation. Um, I think some of you guys may have seen it before in some of my other classes, but I really think it's such a cool simulation. Um, and it's also a measles simulation. So I want you to remember measles is the one that really needs the very high percentage of uh, people to be vaccinated. Um, and so this is actually um, a simulator done by the University of Pittsburgh. And they use real data in terms of um, population density and things like that to simulate measles epidemics. So we can look at New Jersey um, and the closest city to us here is Newark, so we're going to basically be looking at Essex County. Um, and so first, I'm going to show you this one here. So this is going to show you um, what would happen with a measles outbreak um, in Essex County with 80% coverage. So 80% of people having measles vaccine. And just for your knowledge... Um, and you can also see what day we're at of the epidemic um, at the top. So you can see 238 days, less than a year, how far a measles epidemic would spread in Essex County with 80% vaccination rate. And that you can think about that and be like, hmm, 
80% is kind of high. And look at what this would, would lead to. Now I'm going to show you the same simulation. It's also going to go through 238 days, um, but it's going to be showing you the same thing in Essex County if we had 95% coverage. And so you might say 80 and 95% aren't that big of a difference, but what I want you to see is that it kind of below and above the threshold makes a huge difference. And so if we look at 95%, start this at the beginning, go. Now it gets really boring because it goes all the way to 238, but there's no more cases. Um, so you can see kind of that difference between what this outbreak would look like above and below that herd immunity uh, threshold number. And those are things that you were able to work on in that assignment um, where you were able to actually kind of play with the numbers and see how it worked for yourself um, in that assignment. Um, sometimes people will look at this information and they will look at information like this and say, hooray, um, this means I don't have to get my measles vaccine. I just have to be a good salesman of measles vaccine and tell everyone else to get it. I'm gonna be one of the 5%. Um, but what I want you to realize is that that 5% includes um, people who got vaccinated and their vaccine didn't work for whatever reason that day, but also cancer patients who cannot get vaccinated, people with allergies who cannot get vaccinated, anyone who's on any of the immunosuppressive medications that we talked about earlier this semester who might not be able to be vaccinated, um, kids who are too young to be vaccinated, things like that. So in fact, especially with measles, it kind of takes all of us to get to that high of a percentage. Um, and so, um, this is one of the reasons why it's so important for all of us to sort of get vaccinated as we can, um, because there are people who are unable to, and we have to protect them by getting uh, vaccinated ourselves. Um, so one other kind of piece that I wanna mention is something that is also um, something that we've gotten, or we've had a lot of discussion about um, in the past couple of years. Um, I feel like this is one topic I have been asked to comment on um, very often um, throughout the pandemic. Um, and it also kind of has to do with the individual immunity aspect. It also kind of has to do with the herd immunity aspect. Um, and it's sort of thinking about really what's going on here with our vaccines. And the reason why I tell you this is because I think that many members of the general public have a little bit of a mistaken idea about some parts of what's going on with the vaccine. And because of that mistaken idea, then sometimes they'll see some data and they'll be like, see, it's all hogwash, right? They'll kind of be like, all right, it's all wrong because this of this little fact. And so I wanna kind of point out some of the things that we're understanding. And I'll tell you there are a bunch of things that we have started understanding slightly differently during the pandemic that I can't even get into here because I still don't know how we even define them. But I want to just at least give you some points of things to think about. So one of the biggest things comes back to this in a particular uh, image. Note that what I'm showing you with that secondary response is that the virus is infecting the person for a short period of time but we don't see any illness. And so here, what we're really seeing is vaccine working to protect this person against disease, even if they are getting infected. Um, again, I mentioned before, for a long time, we didn't have good ways to distinguish those two things. So we just said vaccines pretended, protected you from, from all of it. <laughs> now people are doing things like using super, super sensitive COVID tests after they get vaccinated and they're like, oh my gosh, I was infected. Vaccines don't work, throw this all out the window. Um, and note that you know, in 2009, 
I was already drawing this, that you could get infected. It's just the idea is that you're going to not get sick or you're going to get less severely ill than you would have otherwise. Um, and so there is a lot of discussion about kind of what actually do vaccines protect against. Um, you know, ideally, maybe this, va this um, you know, you might have a vaccine that could completely keep the virus out of every single cell of your body. That's a pretty high bar. That's a pretty tall order to not ever let the virus into any one cell in your entire body. Um, that's actually called, would be called sterilizing immunity. And so it would be kind of a block at this point. You might imagine perhaps neutralizing antibodies if they were present at really high levels could do that. But we can also imagine maybe we let the virus get into your body a little bit and we kill it before it gets very high um, using things like T cells and neutralizing antibodies together. And that seems a little more likely. And so we can think, you know, does a vaccine, is a vaccine meant to protect you completely from ever having the virus? Probably not really. It's much more about protecting you from disease and having your entire immune system be a part of it. It's also much more about protecting you from transmitting. If you have some virus, but you don't have as much, you're probably less likely to transmit. And that's probably playing a role in that herd immunity thing where we're not seeing transmission from person to person as much because each individual person has less virus. Um, one of the reasons why I think that this is important to talk about, um, I'm actually going to, I'm actually gonna do this slide later. Um, and so really kind of what we think about is perhaps this is what it looks like at the top um, in terms of a group of people who might have SARS-CoV-2. Some fraction of them are asymptomatic, some fraction have sort of smaller uh, amounts of symptoms, all the way up to some fraction being hospitalized, some being uh, in the ICU, some having a fatality. What we're, what we're hoping the vaccine does is kind of shift this whole thing over. So more people are asymptomatic, and people who might have otherwise had a cold maybe have lighter symptoms, and people who might have otherwise had a flu maybe now have the cold-like symptoms, and people who otherwise might have been hospitalized maybe now have less severe symptoms. That's really what we're looking for the vaccine to do, not for it to completely block all types of infection immediately at all times, um, but really to kind of help once that you've been infected, control that virus, keep it at a low level, and clear it. Um, and the is related to lots of different types of immune responses that are happening in different parts of the body. So, you know, for example, in order to stop the virus from getting into any cells of your body, you would have to have antibodies in your nose to stop it from getting into the very first cell. But if all you really wanted to do was stop it from having, making severe disease, you could let it get into your nose and stop it from reproducing in your lung. Um, and kind of keep things going that way. And that's an easier thing for us to imagine the immune system doing. It's probably pretty likely that slightly different things are happening at different times. Right after you get the vaccine, right after you give a boost and really turn on some plasma cells and some memory B cells, you probably do have a lot of antibodies. You probably have a ton of neutralizing antibodies in the tissue. You actually might be protected from infection for a little while. But you're probably not gonna be protected from infection forever because those antibodies are gonna wane, just like we've seen before. But you're still gonna have memory cells and things that are going to protect you from disease. So this is one thing to think about um, when people are thinking about, you know, did the vaccine work? Sometimes your question is, well, what does work mean? Does work mean protect you from infection? does work mean protect you from severe disease? Someone might ask me, how long does the vaccine work? Well, what are you looking for? The data that I've seen is, and this is the best data, and this is, I will admit this data is a little old, so there might be better data out there. I, I will not say that I've read every single paper on this, but some of the data that there was some really nice data that said what, every booster you get, you are not gonna get infected for seven weeks. You've got seven weeks where your antibody levels are so high 
that you're protected from infection. But after that, it's mostly about protection from disease. Um, as your memory cells are still there, they're ready to respond really well, but you may not be sort of at that level of protection from infection. And when you read articles about this in the New York Times or what have you, they don't usually you know, specify protection against infection or protection against disease or protection against severe disease. They, they say it works or not. And so you should be really careful about what exactly those definitions are as you're hearing what does or does not work and what does or does not happen. Um, one other way to kind of mention this is that these are Pfizer's data um, from the Pfizer vaccine trial. So basically what they were looking at is they had two groups of people who either got COVID vaccine or who got placebo. Um, I don't want to get into all of the details of um, the numbers, but I'm just going to say, look at the sort of more than seven days after dose two numbers, which really are the people who got the full vaccine. So those are kind of the important numbers for us. And so they had um, 21,669 people who got um, the vaccine. They had 21,686 who got the placebo, and then they just watched them. And they looked to see how many of them got COVID. One thing that becomes really important here is you have to say, what did they define as getting COVID? What did they define as the vaccine not working, right? Did they look to see with PCR, if these people got infected, were they looking for infection? Were they looking for disease? Were they looking for death? What were they looking for here? Um, the answer is actually they were looking for having COVID with two symptoms on the list. So they had a list of symptoms. You had to have two of those symptoms, uh, and that's what it was. And so for them, it was actually kind of having disease. They didn't check to see if people got infected. So this isn't, they never, claimed it protected people from infection. They pro claimed it protected people from disease with these types of data. So in the blue lines, you see over time how many people got COVID in the placebo group. And so you can see as time went on, more and more and more and more and more and more people got COVID. And as time went on in the red line, you see the people who got vaccine and how many of them got COVID. And so you can see really early um, they were, the two were about the same, and then basically people when the vaccine group didn't get COVID, people in the placebo group did. In the end, nine out of 21,669 people in the vaccine group got COVID, 172 out of the people in the placebo group got COVID. Um, this is how they get to 95% vaccine efficacy. Um, note that that doesn't mean that like 95% of the people in one group got COVID or something. Um, it's still a kind of small number in both groups. Um, there's a particular calculation that you do to make this work. Um, notice that it doesn't say that everyone in the vaccine group didn't get COVID. Even in this trial, nine out of 21,000 did. So, you know, from the beginning, we knew that some small number of people could potentially get the infection, but we've reduced the probability quite dramatically. But again, note that thinking about protection from what becomes really key when analyzing um, all of these types of data. Um, so when I was um, in graduate school, a big part of what I was working on was um, vaccine development. And when we are thinking about vaccine development, um, there are a few major criteria that we are imagining. Um, so we've got a few things to think about when making a vaccine. One thing is that if we're going to have a successful vaccination, we need to get an appropriate immune response. Um, just getting an immune response isn't exactly enough. It actually has to be the right kind of response. So sometimes you can make a great vaccine that gives a whole bunch of antibodies, but those antibodies aren't neutralizing. And so your vaccine actually doesn't protect. Sometimes you'll find out that for a vaccine to be protective, it needs to make CD8 T cells. Um, and in the past, this was sort of done by trial and error, or it was done where we would find some people who survived 
the infectious disease, measure their immune responses, and try to figure out how to copy them. Um, now we know a lot more immunology, so we can actually try on purpose to make neutralizing antibodies or CD8 T cells and not just trial and error it. Um, and so oftentimes we will do things like measure types of immune responses we might want to make, which are known as the correlates of immune protection. Um, say, okay, people who seem to be healthy make this kind of immune response. Now let's design a strategy to make that kind of immune response. Um, I'm going to skip this one and come back to that. Um, ideally, we need our protection to be long lasting. Um, and you can sort of think about, well, if I can make a great vaccine that lasts, that gives you an immune response for two days, that's cool. But that means you have to get it and know I am too, I'm going to get sick in the next two days. Or it means you need to go back to the doctor and get another shot every two days. Um, we have a pretty hard time getting people to do that. Um, you can look at the current numbers in terms of how many people are up to date with all of the COVID boosters. You can see number of people in the US that got one, two, three, four, and you, know, you can see the numbers pretty dramatically drop off. Um, and one of the things that I remember pretty dramatically on this one is um, in one lab meeting I was in, um, we were all kind of like, can you believe people won't get more, like enough shots? And this is like years ago. Can you believe they won't go and get all the shots they need to do? And like, yeah, those terrible people. And my boss was like, whoa, wait a minute guys, let's stop. The hepatitis B vaccine is required to work in this lab. It is three shots. Raise your hand if you got shot one. And pretty much everybody in the room Raise your hand if you got shot two. Some hands went down. Raise your hand if you got shot three. More hands went down. And he's like, okay, look around. You're vaccine developers. If you're not at 100%, why are you expecting everyone else to be doing it? Um, and so ideally, we'd love to make all of our vaccines one shot deals Would that let them last forever because then we don't have to get people to come back because it's hard to get people to come back. And you can imagine how it's hard to get you to come back. And then you might imagine somebody who is in um, a particularly underserved area where maybe there aren't enough medical facilities, or maybe they're in a super rural area where they had to travel for two days to get to a medical facility or something like that. And you can imagine how hard this would be. Um, ideally, we want um, the, the World Health Organization would like all doses to cost less than a dollar per dose. So we want to be getting a low dose. We want something that is genetically stable, so we don't want to put a vaccine in you and have it mutate, um, and then like spread and do terrible things around the world. That would be bad. Um, we have to think a lot about storage considerations. So one of the things we think a lot about in ma vaccine manufacture is something called the cold chain. Um, specifically, there are some vaccines, and this also came up at the beginning of the COVID vaccine rollout, that have to be kept at minus 80 Celsius, which is a freezer we have downstairs. Um, but your doctor's office does not have a minus 80. Um, you know, outside of research labs, you generally don't find them. Um, and to have a minus 80 freezer, um, you have to have reliable electricity. Um, and if your vaccine needs to be kept at minus 80 from the point of manufacture until it goes into someone's arm, um, do you have reliable electricity and reliable shipping all of that way across? And can you actually deliver your uh, and store your vaccine the way it needs to be stored? Um, some of the early COVID vaccines we thought needed to be stored at minus 80, and so there were actually big issues in terms of distribution, just in terms of who had a minus 80 and who didn't. Um, as well as things like thinking about delivery, um, oral vaccine versus needle-based vaccine, things like that. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that on the next slide. Um, but we also think a lot about safety of vaccines. Um, we want them to not cause disease and to have minimal side effects. Um, note that this is a tricky problem um, because um, here I list it as being minimal side effects. What is the definition of minimal side effects? Yeah, Emma. I'm just thinking about the COVID vaccine. Like, some people would get a fever or like muscle aches, nothing like too severe that would cause you to have to be like hospitalized or. Okay. Stress one. Okay. 
So a question of whether you have to be seen, whether you have to be hospitalized, that's what you would say is minimal side effects. Anybody else? So the, to be perfectly honest with you, the definition of minimal side effect varies a lot from person to person. And what people will take as an acceptable side effect varies a lot. Part of it is related to how severe is the disease. If I'm gonna, not that this is an infectious disease, not that this is a silly example, I know, but if I was going to make a vaccine to protect you against hangnails, you probably would not want a lot of bad side effects, but if I was going to make a vaccine to protect you against um, Ebola, especially when you were getting ready to travel to an area where there was a lot of Ebola, you probably would be okay with some more side effects. And so one of the problems here is kind of like, what is the level of side effects and how do you know? Sometimes one question that comes up is, um, you know, how rare or common of a side effect is there? Note that when I showed you the Pfizer data, they were looking in 20,000 people in each arm. And that was honestly one of the biggest vaccine trials that had been done. So that's great, it can, but if something happens to one person in that, is it that, does that mean that it happens in one out of 20,000 or five out of 100,000? Or does it mean that that was just one unlucky person? And what about a side effect that's a one in a million side effect? You're probably not gonna see it in 20,000 people, but when you go into the eight billion people you have in the world, then you certainly are going to see it. Um, and you, so there's gonna be kind of this question as well. The other thing that comes up is that Emma, one of the side effects Emma mentioned a second ago was fever. If you think about some of the side effects you often feel from vaccines, you think about things like fever, right? What other things do you think of as vaccine side effects? Sore arm. Sore arm. Anything else? Sometimes I'm a little tired. Yeah? What do those side effects have in common? What, or why do you see those side effects? So what specifically is going on when you're making that, uh, when you get that vaccine? What's the first thing that has to happen? Yeah. Like your innate immune cells and proteins. You need to have an innate immune response. You need to make those inflammatory cytokines that we talked about. Remember how much we've talked about with the importance of a good innate immune response to um, making a good adaptive response. You want an innate, a good innate response. Well, innate responses tend to come with some physiological symptoms. And so we don't really know how to separate those things. And so it's sort of like, you know, you know, I, when my friends post online about getting vaccines and how bad they feel, I always write, like, I'm so glad to hear your immune system is working as it should. None of them have punched me yet. Um, but there's a certain amount of, like, that's what, what we know about the immune system. If we want to harness it, we we're gonna do that. And so how do you kind of balance those side effects? Um, how do you balance, well, what if I gave people like even more fever, they'd make a better response. Like what's a good enough response versus too much side effect and how, how do you balance that? So this is actually really challenging. Um, one of the reasons why a lot of people don't want to get vaccinated is related to the delivery issue that I've mentioned here, um, oral versus needle. Um, why, why is that perhaps related to percent of people who get vaccinated? Yeah, Andrew. Because some people get the phobia of getting needles. Yeah, some people are afraid of shots, right? Some people say, I, I, I'm just afraid of getting a shot. So they're like, if you could just give me a vaccine in a way that wasn't a shot, I would be on board. So they, and often what they'll say to me is, I think you should make vaccines that are a pill, that I can just take a pill. Now that you've been through a semester of immunology, how do you feel about that vaccine that's a pill? Yeah, yes. We talked about how like your gut is more tolerant of like exposure things, so you might not have a response. Yeah, we also know that many, when you see a lot of antigens for the first time through the GI tract, you get tolerance, that oral tolerance phenomenon. Um, and so, uh, sometimes when people are like, I want you to give me a vaccine that's a pill, I'm like, yeah, we really don't know how to do that. Um, so people are actually spending a lot of time thinking about how to change route of immunization. Um, you know, some vaccines, there are a couple that are given 
um, either in um, the nasal cavity or in the GI tract, but most of them are delivered directly into a muscle or under the skin. Um, I, at one point we were doing a whole bit, we were trying to do nasal delivery in guinea pigs in an experiment that I was doing, and I will tell you that I learned guinea pigs have a very strong sneeze reflex. Um, and so we would actually anesthetize them, um, vaccine, put vaccines up their nose, and they would all sneeze it back out. And so, you know, that worked really well. Um, but one of the things that people are trying to do is think about other ways that they might be able to do this. Um, there is this famous paper that people have been talking about, about maybe being able to get um, intranasal and try to get trafficking back to the nasal cavity. But a lot of people are thinking about things like um, micro patches, where you can just put a patch on your skin that has these little micro needles that gives you the the benefits of kind of the skin um, injection without kind of having a needle. And so it would be like slapping on a little Band-Aid like this um, for like a day and then taking the patch off and then you'd be all set. And so there, people are working on things like this, um, but there's still you know, a lot to be done. Yeah, Emma. So why are some vaccines administered subcutaneously versus intramuscularly? Is it just seems to be like almost the same location? <laughs> Um, my, my biggest answer here is, historically, a lot of this was done by trial and error. We did something, it worked, the FDA approved it, we went with it. Um, and only more recently are we doing things more rationally with the design. And so some of the ones that are done either sub-Q versus IM are some of the historical vaccines that kind of have been grandfathered into it. That is the easiest answer I can give you. <laughs> um, all right. So... Um, for the rest of the time, I want to tell you a little bit about some of the vaccine types that are out there. Um, and I'm absolutely going to be blowing through this, but I'm going to hit a couple highlights. So basically the idea here is now what was in that magical syringe, that preparation that was giving you a primary immune response to potentially allow you to make making a secondary response when you are injected. Uh, infected later. What you can see from this image is that there are lots of different technologies that are out there for vaccines. Like I said, hitting total highlights right now because I got 10 minutes and want to at least tell you some key stuff here. Um, so with the classic vaccines, kind of the first ever vaccines that we understood, um, we had what were known as live attenuated vaccines. And so these are vaccines where we are using a live form of the pathogen, but a form of that pathogen that is weakened. Um, so the idea is that the pathogen can actually replicate. We can get sort of all the antigens made. We can get all the forms of the life cycle done, but we can't cause disease. Um, we might get some more mild disease, but the things that are really gonna cause a severe disease are gone from that microbe. Um, and so, if you, uh, so your measles vaccine, um, your mumps vaccine, um, your rubella vaccine, your chickenpox vaccine, um, and your polio vaccine, um, we're all likely, uh, no, you probably didn't get the live attenuated polio. Um, um, but they were live attenuated. These are great, because they, these are like the gold standard. They induce amazingly awesome immune response but they can reproduce. They're microbes that reproduce. And so they could potentially mutate. They have to be refrigerated. You have to care about how you store them. Um, if you are in a person who is immunocompromised, they might actually cause, cause some disease. There are some situations where people didn't know they were immunocompromised and get one of these vaccines and then bad things happen. Um, in the past, when making live attenuated vaccines, um, we would actually just put the microbe in culture on cells and wait until it got mutations to make it weakened. The tuberculosis vaccine, they put in culture for 28 years before they got the mutations. And it, it's a mess. I mentioned before, tuberculosis vaccine, not great. I'm not gonna have time to go through all the details of not great, but part of it's because it was 28 years in culture and is a mess. Um, now we actually know things about the microbe. We can say like, oh look, the red gene is the one that's the one that's important for making you sick. Let's actually take the red gene out. Or let's 
make mutations in the red gene, so it can't make you sick anymore. So now if we're doing a live attenuated, we actually are doing it in a directed fashion based on our knowledge of the microbe. Um, we can also have an inactivated vaccine. So with an inactivated vaccine, you are using a killed form of the pathogen. Um, so this is good because the pathogen can't reproduce anymore, um, but antigens are still gonna be present. Um, this is going to give you perhaps a little bit of symptoms, but fewer symptoms. It's also gonna be safer because the microbe is dead. Um, and so your flu shots, as well as your polio vaccine are uh, likely inactivated. Um, so this is gonna be stable, it's not gonna mutate, it's gonna be really safe, you don't have to refrigerate it, but it generally isn't gonna give you a great immune response. You're probably gonna need some boosters. Um, there are arguments in the field, but the, these may not get into the cytoplasm of cells very well, so they may not access MHC class one and get a good CD8 response these may largely be inducing antibody responses. Um, so many of the vaccines you received in your life work that way. We also have some newer um, types of vaccines. And um, the big idea, so the, the slide after this mentions three types for time purposes, but all three of them actually have something in common, which is that in all three of them, we have identified a part of the microbe that is the problem and are using a purified version of that part of the microbe instead of the full microbe. So here you can see SARS-CoV-2. With SARS-CoV-2, the idea would be we know that almost all of the immune responses or a, the vast majority of the immune responses are actually directed against this protein spike. And so instead of using a live version of this virus or even a dead version of this virus, we just make the spike protein in the lab and inject the spike protein into you. Um, this is known as a subunit vaccine. I'm just gonna skip to subunit vaccines. Yes, there are other parts you can make, but I'm not gonna go into them right now. Um, and so we can, originally people would just like break the virus and take the part. Now we make it totally in the lab. So we get, that virus was never even in the lab. It is completely safe. There is no chance of infection, no chance of stuff going wrong here. And you might make a really good um, response to this um, purified protein. There are two vaccines you have likely received in your life or that you may have received in your life that are subunit vaccines, which are the hepatitis B vaccine and the human papillomavirus or HPV vaccines. Those are both subunit vaccines that are purified proteins that we know are key antigens from the microbe. Um, when we think about a lot of our vaccines, the problem with both inactivated and subunit vaccines is sort of a similar problem. They're both just not as good as live attenuated. Live attenuated give you this amazing immune response. Some of that's because you get like all the life cycle stages of the microbe. Um, but we've realized that there are actually some other parts to it as well. Um, with a live attenuated vaccine, you can give some dose, some little dose like this, right? And the microbe reproduces, because it's alive. And so it increases in amount. And sort of that dose increases over time and kind of pushes you up to a nice high immune response. If you're putting in a dead, inactivated virus or a purified protein, the amount you put in doesn't increase at all. You put some in and that's it. And that can give you a little bit of an immune response. And so you might actually have to use more doses to push the immune response to that same level that you would have needed for the live attenuated. And so some of it is a question of the dose doesn't amplify, so because that viral protein doesn't replicate or infect. Another big problem that we see with some, a lot of these vaccines is we don't have great PRR simulation. You use a microbe, like a live virus, then you got the PRRs from the microbe. If you use a purified protein that's made in the lab, 
There's no PRR stem there. And so you're not going to get great signal one and signal two. And so we often are going to have to kind of help those proteins out to get an inflammatory response. With the inactivated and the subunit vaccines, um, we also don't usually see those in the cytoplasm. And so we don't see production uh, presentation on class one. We don't see a good CD8 response. And so we also aren't really accessing um, class one presentation. One of the things that we can do about this is that we can add on an additional component into the vaccine, particularly a component that can help out with that PRR stimulation and with that inflammation response. Um, this is known as an adjuvant, and it will help you make a more robust adaptive response with less antigen. Some of that has to do with impacting antigen stability and localization, but some of it has to do with influencing antigen presentation, and a lot of it is about giving a stimulus for PRR signaling. Um, adjuvants are kind of a hot topic in the field, because if we could find adjuvants, we could probably make some vaccines that are kind of meh work better. But if you get more of an inflammatory response, which is what your adjuvant is supposed to do, you're probably going to increase the side effects on your vaccine. And so that trade-off becomes really important in adjuvant design. Um, there are, for example, some adjuvants that are approved in Europe that are approved in Europe that are not approved in the United States. Um, and so exactly kind of what adjuvants we can use and how we might design or develop or understand more is really key. Um, so all of these things are awesome. And then mRNA vaccines um, were uh, designed to deal with a lot of the cons of some of these other vaccine types. Um, the short answer is basically, we know that protein that we wanted to put in as a subunit, we knew like we should put that spike protein in. But we want that spike protein to access class one, to be in the cytoplasm of cells. So instead of giving you the protein that can't get into cells and get into the cytoplasm, we give you the RNA. So the RNA can be made in cells in the cytoplasm and we can put that protein on class one, and we can get both an antibody and um, a CD8 response. Um, because a lot of the big, um, because there are a bunch of PRRs that recognize um, nucleic acid, these also have their own, they're also sort of provide their own PAMP um, in being nucleic acid, so they solve a lot of those problems with other things. We'd love to talk about them on and on and on, but I'm out of time. Um, Drew Weissman and Katie Carrico won the Nobel Prize this year. Katie Carrico's biography just came out. Um, her story is super fascinating, and I would strongly, strongly, strongly recommend um, reading more about um, her work as an immigrant and is getting turned down from all sorts of things and all of the challenges she went through and then won the Nobel Prize from it. Um, and that's what I have to say. So thank you guys for an awesome semester. Um, I will see you for the review session tomorrow at 10 um, on Zoom. Um, you will get an email from me with uh, additional information. I'll see you for the exam on Monday. Come to my office for an index card. And remember your assignment is due by 5. Thank you.